Hello and welcome to the Ethereum Engineering Group Meetup. Today I've got Mikhail Kalininen and he's going to tell us all about the ETH1, ETH2 merge. Um, and um, he's the you're leading the efforts at, um, with in collaboration with Ethereum Foundation, aren't you, Mikhail? Would that be fair to say? Um, yeah. So that, yeah. that's probably you should fair. Yeah. yeah, please introduce yourself as well. Um, so I've been in like Ethereum space since 2015. By the time I joined um, the startup um, and uh, started to work on Ethereum J, joined the Ethereum J development. Um, after that, I worked on other few projects. Um, and uh, when uh, finally Ethereum J got deprecated and uh, we started to work on um, sharding, but before sharding, we also participated in Casper FFG, a hybrid consensus um, proposal, implemented it in Ethereum J. So, and then switched to sharding and then it do. Uh, so then we joined consensus and now I'm here working on the merge um, for about for about a year already. So that's that's my story. In, yeah, that's my a, short story. No, it's a great story. Um, so thank you for that. Could you please, um, yeah, just run through your slides. Yeah, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks everyone for coming. Very excited to present here. Um, so <clears throat> do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Cool. Um, so let's speak about the merge today. Um, it's going to be rather an overview uh, on different um, aspects of the merge um, without any deep dive into technical details. Uh, I can answer uh, any questions on the technical details, of course, if you wish. So, but <clears throat> that's more on an overview. Um, so. The first part of my slides uh, will be uh, the slides that I were presenting on during the R&D week at Consensus. So for those who has attended and saw this presentation, uh, there will probably not much of new content there. So, but yep, um, let's just start. Um, I will do some stops during the presentation uh, for questions. But feel free to interrupt me if anything is not clear enough. Okay, so so the merge, what the merge is, <clears throat> the merge is like the main net upgrade, the Ethereum main net upgrade. Um, and it could introduce a bunch of changes, but the most important one, the core change is the consensus upgrade. Um, and uh, let's start to talk about this um, change uh, first. Um, there are some other changes. Uh, we will, if we have a time, we will probably cover them today. Um, so I get prepared for that. Okay, the consensus upgrade, what does it mean? Um, so let's start from the, um, from what do we have today already? Um, we have the Ethereum mainnet, which is like secured by the ETH hash algorithm, the proof of work. Um, so uh, each block of Ethereum mainnet uh, carries like uh, a bit of consensus data. Uh, those uh, consensus, those bits are verified by the clients as a part of block processing operation. Um, and uh, yeah, so it might seem that it hash um, has no state, but it's arguably not. Uh, not true. And the state of ETH hash is uh, the chain of headers starting from Genesis and up to the head of the chain. So uh, that's what uh, actually FastSync does. When it downloaded a state or being downloaded in the state, it starts to download the chain of headers to prove that uh, the chain uh, it's, syncing, it's being synced with um, is canonical one. So that's regarding the state, um, it has like doesn't have its own network, it piggybacks on the application network. 
because each bit of uh, uh, consensus data is relatively small. It's like um, like uh, several, a few dozens of uh, bytes. Um, on the other hand, we already have the beacon chain, which is up and running. Um, the beacon chain uh, is the driver of new proof of stake consensus. Um, currently, the beacon chain is in consensus uh, with its own. So there is no payload there. Um, and the beacon chain has like an explicit state which is called the beacon state. Uh, the main entity of the beacon state is validators. It also carries the history, uh, which is very handy. You may prove any block. Um, if you have like the most recent beacon state, you may prove that the, some block, which was like a part of the beacon chain an year ago um, is, has been there. So by using the history accumulator in the state, um, really nice property it has it maintains the randomness uh, for its uh, own needs first but the random but this randomness could be exposed to the application layer we'll speak about it a bit later. it maintains finality data so which is really important too uh, a really important property of the new consensus um, and it has uh, its own network um, so there is the beacon net chain network, uh, which mostly exploded by um, validators uh, who uh, to, to propagate their votes on the box. So that's that's it. So it has like really uh, a rich network layer. Um, what properties does new consensus have with regard to the proof of work? Um, so it, First of all, it has non-probabilistic finality. This is just great. Um, it has randoms, I already like, mentioned it. Uh, it comes with like lower issuing, issuance costs uh, because uh, there is no need to burn electricity and pay for electricity and or hardware um, amortization. So the issuance is really uh, lower than for the proof of work. Um, it has a bounded state. Um, this, the state of the beacon state is bounded to the number of validators and the, uh, the limit on the state uh, the max size of the state is about uh, half of a gigabyte um, actually history accumulator growth um, it ever, it, it's ever growing but uh, the growth is like uh, one or two megabytes per hundred of years which is negligible um, <clears throat> with, if we compare this uh, like half of a gigabyte to the state of it hash, we'll see that it hash already have about five gigabytes and it's ever growth. Um, so the state is not like a big problem um, of the new consensus. Um, I mean, uh, some might say that there is a state, so it should be maintained. No, it's like not, it's even cheaper than for the proof of work. Um, it's fine grained, fine, fine grained. Uh, the, the consensus is fine grained. Uh, what it means, it means that you can uh, sample um, a portion, uh, a subset of validators uh, with the usage of randomness and uh, ask them to come to consensus on a particular thing uh, without loss in security. So this is how shared committees uh, does work. This is how the light client committee will work. Uh, this property could be extended on uh, different things. So this is really, I think uh, that this is really nice property of the new consensus. So we can add something else here, anything else here if we need in the future. Um, it's time bounded, meaning that there are strict time boundaries uh, at which we can expect to get a block from the network. Um, on the other hand, uh, the problem is that um, the, the downside of this time bounding is like if you're not uh, supposed, if if you're not, if you were not, not able to fire a block uh, or attestation in time, it will either be discarded by the network or uh, you will it will result in some losses uh, for validator rewards. Um, everything above uh, all these nice properties comes with uh, the costs on the network layer. Um, I mentioned that it's heavily exploited uh, by the validators 
to fire other stations. So that's um, a, a lot of things um, happening there um, with regard to the this tiny consensus bit that come in each block. And uh, it's the new consensus is pretty complicated in terms of algorithms. Um, I'm not saying that it hash is not comp a complex algorithm, but if you're like understand the it hash as a black box, things uh, get much easier. <clears throat> but here we have like a lot of um, crypto economics and a lot of on the fork choice. It's not that trivial as the total difficulty fork choice. Um, okay, so that's like the comparison. That's the new consensus. So let's then speak about how do we really, um, how are we going to upgrade the consensus? How will the uh, main net will look like after this upgrade? Um, so uh, what we do, uh, the, like the most core change here is to put the application payload, which is stripped down if the if one styled block um uh this is like the block uh, that carrying uh, the application lo payload carries the user transactions state and receipt route and everything else that is required by the execution um uh, it's mostly like the same um number of fields as uh, the ethereum block uh, as of today uh, but without consensus part so um, it's included on the beacon chain in every block, uh, every beacon block producer produced this application payload uh, and puts it in and includes it into it, its block. And this application payload validity and the execution validity becomes uh, a validity rule of the beacon block, which means that if something bad happens here and uh, transactions, uh, transaction execution doesn't match the state route, that is announced here, then the whole beacon block is invalidated. Um, so that's about the beacon chain. The application chain retains, so it's not it's not thrown away. Um, there is a reason for, for that, a really strong reason. I will speak about it later. Um, so the application chain is just mimicking the beacon chain um, and uh, each application payload can be turned into a block. So, because this is actually a block without consensus data. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, what application chain can't do since we do this upgrade, uh, it can't uh, say what is the head of the chain. Instead of that, the beacon chain, the consensus chain um, dictates the head of the chain to the application layer. So that's like the, um, um, uh, the change that we would like to do to, to that we will do to make this consensus upgrade. So th there is the application chain that is like managed by the consensus chain. Um, do not, please do not be confused about these terms. Consensus chain and beacon chain are actually um, mean, have the same meaning. And application chain and main net and application network and application layer is the continuation of the main net as of today, but uh, driven by the beacon chain consensus. So yeah, beacon chain is responsible for the fork choice, which is the key um, um, thing to understand this scheme. Um, if we had like shard data here on this picture, um, so we can see that the application payload and the application may have a native access now may have a native access to data shards um, by reading the proof of stake um, state the beacon state uh, one of these kind of applications are going to be rollups and uh, here we are like uh, very close to the rollup centric roadmap so this is how it works. Well, we'll, we'll see how the application uh, layer will get this access a bit later. Um, on the network side, uh, not much of a change here, actually. So 
consensus and the application network stays almost unchanged consensus network um the the beacon chain network or the consensus network starts to <clears throat> propagate uh, blocks with the application payload uh thus we don't need this block gossip here and actually we can't do block gossip on the application layer anymore because it doesn't know if the block is valid or not so everything regarding block gossip happens here and regarding application blocks gossip also happens here um, application network will keep maintaining the history sync this is the history block sync and receive sync which are uh, required by some existing by some of existing applications um, and uh, state sync will undergo some modifications but uh, it, it will be just driven by the um, consensus part by the consensus block choice but the algorithms will likely stay the same also application network will maintain transaction pool uh, this is for the purpose of creating new blocks uh, so the transaction pool will just stay remain the same so that's all for network so let's get to clients how the client evolve us within this upgrade um, so there will be two parts of two layers uh, in the client Actually, Ethereum mainnet client also has, has two layers, but they are not that decoupled as we see all, like in this setup. Um, so the consensus part of the um, client will like listen to the blocks coming from the wire. Uh, we'll uh, ask the application layer to insert the new application payload when, it, when the new block is coming to insert and verify that the execution uh, went correctly. And also it will ask to produce uh, the new payload when the there is a time to produce a new beacon block for, for the proposer. Um, uh, the fork choice events like finality, uh, actually it's not the fork choice, it's Casper FFG, but anyway. Uh, and uh, the change of the head of the chain will be uh, communicated down to the application layer so it can like uh, change the head and finalize and do some garbage collection. Um, also by inserting and uh, like specifying new head, the application layer may maintain his, its own chain, the application chain. Um, so, and what is really important uh, since the application chain remains the same, this is, uh, this is the important part for the JSON RPC to stay almost the same because it's tightly coupled to the structure of the application chain to the structure of the block, so forth. And the JSON RPC is important for um, a lot for a lot of infrastructure. Um, so that's that's why it's important to keep the application chain in the game. Um, at least for the beginning. So for, for the consensus upgrade, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, what type of client will we probably see? Um, it's not like certain, but anyway, uh, we will need, uh, or I, I forgot to mention that here is the facade uh, that uh, the consensus and application layer are talking to each other. It could be either an RPC, so it could be a separated pieces of software communicated via some RPC, or it could be like one piece of software um, communicating through the API. Uh, we can imagine that if it's two pieces of software, we need like consensus node um, and application node. We have like a bunch of Ethereum, um, a bunch of beacon chain clients here and a bunch of Ethereum mainnet clients. So we can uh, imagine that they could be modified to become Beacon chain node and consensus node and application node, respectively. Um, also, for the casual users, it would be really handy if they can just download like one thing and it works. Um, so, the kind of monolithic uh, clients that could be built uh, with usage of uh, like this um, existing clients or a brand new. Um, uh, and yeah, they will work in the same fashion as Ethereum mainnet client 
today. So for users, that will be not a big shift if we have this kind of client. I mean, in terms, you just download it and it works. Um, okay, so let's go to the applications. Um, as it's been said, JSON RPC mostly remains. So um, some of the some of these um, methods will have to are dependent uh, depend on the um, head of the chain. So what the application layer will know about it from the consensus layer. So it's not a like a big deal. And for user uh, the interface and the methods and the semantics of these methods will stay the same, uh, which means that the infrastructure can keep using them and the developers tool chains will be still uh, usable and uh, will not have to be changed. Probably at all, probably uh, to just adopt new and uh, new endpoints, new methods. Like if we get the finality, non-probabilistic finality, we would like to expose it to the application layer, to the infrastructure layer. So we will see this kind of uh, methods, probably some others. Um, on the EVM side, uh, there is going to be a beacon block root of code. Uh, the beacon block root of code uh, allows to allows for reading the either the beacon block data or the beacon state data. The beacon state is like linked to every beacon block, uh, and due to the merkleization properties of the beacon chain, uh, there could be build a pr proof uh, of some state data linked to the beacon block root. So that's why uh, this uh, of code is called beacon block root instead of the beacon state root. So we don't need like the beacon state root. It will save us some like, you know, couple of uh, slots of proof, but yeah, we'll see if we need it. So um, this is how actually uh, the application layer will read the beacon state and will read the shard data um, and everything else, uh, which is gonna be on the beacon state. For example, withdrawals will also use this upcode, highly likely. Um, nothing is ideal and we have some break and change uh, in the EVM. They are not related to particular proposal of, uh, of the consensus upgrade of how to do this. Uh, they are rather related to the getting rid of proof of work. Um, first, of, first is difficulty. It's like an easy case. Um, so difficulty will not exist since proof of work is gone. That's all. Um, we need some. Uh, the problem is that difficulty is for randomness by some existing applications. So we need to do something with that to preserve the randomness and the straightforward thing to do is to return the most recent randomics, which is the part of randomness that is in the beacon state um, as the return value to this of code. And we can simply rename it to something like random or randau. So it will be a source of true, more strong randomness than we have like on the chain, on, on Ethereum mainnet today. The block hash is the difficult one uh, because the block hash is also used uh, for randomness purposes. Um, and its randomness uh, is secured by the proof of work because we have like this mixed hash and nonce um, in the block, uh, uh, meaning that the cost of rerolling the dice is the cost of block reward for miner. It can do this, but this is pretty high, a relatively high cost. And uh, once we get rid of proof of work, uh, we can manipulate the block hash. Uh, proposers will get this ability. Uh, so it becomes like a source of really weak randomness. Um, but uh, we, we could replace it with Rendao as well. But uh, the problem is that the block hash uh, of its original semantics is the uh, is used uh, as a way to verify the block header 
because if the application, if the smart contract uh, need to read some data from uh, Beacon, uh, I'm sorry, from the block header or uh, from the uh, Ethereum state, it will rather get, accept this block header, verify it against that uh, it, it matched the block hash just by deriving Kichak to 56 uh, in the application, matching to the block hash. And if it matches, then it can uh, parse uh, received root, state root, and do any uh, proof verification against them. So that's the way how the application applications read uh, the data from uh, the uh, blocks uh, today. Uh, so we just if uh, so it means that if we replace it with uh, some randomness, it will break this. Uh, header verification use case, but if we keep it the same, it will break the randomness use case. So both use cases are exist, um, are presented in existing applications. So that's the problem here. And uh, yeah, if anyone uh, really, uh, anyone uses this uh, code in production for their smart contracts, just read me out, uh, yep. we can discuss it. And that's, uh, this, that's an open question. Um, Okay, next, um, last but not least, uh, validators. So how validators will uh, behave, will have to behave uh, after the merge. So they will <clears throat> have to run the application node side of their beacon node, uh, which is actually happening today uh, because the um, Ethereum mainnet node is required for to get votes uh, on ETH1 data on the deposit contract and the that's the main use case for the Ethereum mainnet client uh, for validators today. And for like relatively big infrastructure, they like staker pools and probably some big stakers, they can easily maintain this application node. Uh, it's, it's, it, uh, it's more costly with regard to the beacon node and that's why it would make sense to like maintain um, a few uh, application nodes um, for like and uh, separate uh, and share them across like a lot of beacon nodes something like that um so yeah the application node will expose the rpc to uh to allow to work with the um, application layer duties, uh, like in, in producing a block and so forth. Uh, for home stakers, for individuals who you, who are probably mostly using Infura as of today, um, they will have to be some kind of service uh, to outsource their application layers responsibilities. So uh, I, I, I think they, I think it's possible to like read uh, the block hashes from Infura today with uh, the hashes of blocks that were imported into the chain, meaning that they are uh, those blocks are valid, the execution went well. So what needs to be added is the block production uh, function to, to this kind of services like Infura. So they will just uh, ask the, service to produce a block for them and then include this block into the beacon block and wire it away to the wire. So yeah, docking. Let's stop for questions here. Before we go to docking. Hi, Mikhail. Um, very much a, a big question. Um, if something goes wrong with the transfer from one to two, is it reversible? Um, okay, so it depends on what will go wrong. Um, the docking part is there, uh, it's about exact transition. I mean, we can, you know, yeah, there is some scenarios here. But uh, yeah, just what what do you mean by something goes wrong? Uh, well, um, I, I wouldn't know what would go wrong, but if for some reason 
um, some sort of denial of service attack or some something affected the usability of Ether 2, is it ever possible to wire things back to Ether 1? Um, you mean uh, to like postpone the merge uh, in, in the case of emergency, right? Uh, perhaps not just postpone, but uh, even after the merge, um, oh, I is, guess. is Ether okay. 1 dead and gone or is it possible to return if something um, goes wrong? Yeah. I think it's unlikely scenario to get back to uh, once we get merged, uh, it's unlikely that we get go back to the proof of work. Um, we will rather try uh, like uh, the what would be reasonable to do is rather try to fix um, the what 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 has been broken. So okay, thanks. Okay, any, anything else? Okay, let's move on then. So docking, um, actually the docking is like the docking procedure is the process of producing and finalizing the first proof of stake block on top of the last proof of work block and all the preparations uh, that should be done um, to make this happen. Uh, it comes with, with like two major problems. Um, one of them is how to agree on the last proof of work block, how to do this in protocol. And the other one is more difficult, much more difficult is how to incentivize miners to keep building and securing the chain um, up to the point of merge. Um, so we we'll try to cover both. Uh, first, agreeing on the block. So, assuming that we like we are at the point of merge, um, well, I have uh, some um, block candidates that could be used as like the last proof of work block, uh, which means they match uh, the transition some transition conditions. We'll speak about these conditions later on the next slide, but some conditions and the uh, multiple blocks do satisfy these conditions. Um, so the general approach um, to this, um, to, to handle this would be as follows. Uh, so the proposer of uh, the beacon chain block um, uh, picks the proof of work block uh, to his observation, uh, the reasonable choice is the head of the chain, the head of the proof of work chain to his observation, picks and includes a reference to this block into the beacon block. Then the testers uh, see that the reference of the proof of work block is included and start to attest, uh, and they verify that uh, the block, uh, the proof of work block that is referenced by the proposer is available and valid uh, in terms of uh, Ethereum mainnet validity, but without the checking the uh, proof work part. Um, uh, actually with checking the proof work part, sorry. Um, yeah, that it's valid and uh, also that this block that is referenced match the transition conditions. And if that's okay, um, if that, Checks pass. This checks passed Then a tester um, like votes for this for this beacon block. Um, otherwise, it, it's the otherwise the beacon block. If either like block proof of work block validity is broken or the transition conditions uh, hasn't been satisfied, uh, the, the entire beacon block is invalid. Is considered an invalid and. If that happens, then the next proposer um, gives another try. What's important here is that uh, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't make uh, any difference for the tester uh, whether uh, this proof of work block picked by proposer is the head of the pole chain of the proof of work chain or not. So that's important because uh, we may see like different heads uh, of the proof of work chain due to. Uh, whereas reasons due to uh, network delays and 
some other things. Uh, so that's important not to stick with, uh, not to ask to stick everyone with the head of the chain. Uh, otherwise, uh, they might not come to agreement, uh, like, you know, that quick or ever without manual intervention. intervention. So that's like the general approach. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, transition conditions, what might be them? So the straightforward one is to use um, uh, is to use the number of a block of block on the mainnet, right? It's been used for um, for all of the hard forks we know by today. Um, so the number, um, yeah, it could be used, but there is one problem with the number here. Um, the malicious miner uh, may build the um, Malicious, uh, the adversarial fork with lower difficulty uh, because difficulty formula allows to lower to reduce the difficulty if the blocks if blocks are coming uh, too late. Um, so it may do this uh, and uh, reveal this lower difficulty chain um, at the point of merge. And if there is the malicious uh, proposer on the other side, it can pick this uh, minority fork and start building the main the main net chain uh, secured by proof of stake on top of this minority fork. Also, this minority fork may carry uh, may, may uh, complete the um, double spend attack or something like that. So it's the uh, yeah, it's not revealed. Uh, it's withheld, withheld, uh, withheld by the the the, uh, the miner with withholding this minority fork um, until the time until it starts to satisfy this block height, uh, so the block number condition. Uh, it uh, this kind of attack would require the communication between uh, validators and miners, but uh, yeah, it's not something that really easy to organize, I guess, but uh, we can easily improve on that. And instead of the block number, use the total difficulty as the criteria on the proof of work side, which means that uh, to make the merge happens, to make the merge happen, the certain amount of hash power uh, should be put on the um, proof of work chain. Uh, and which would mean that stays secure uh, until the merge. So instead of height, we would use total difficulty. This is like um, the better choice. Uh, on the beacon chain side, there could be like the other criteria that could be used is that if we know that beacon chain keeps work, keeps building today and um, yeah, we can use like epoch uh, as the point of uh, merge, uh, which means that once the transition epoch epoch happens, uh, the first proposer of this epoch starts to uh, it includes the proof of work block, a reference to the last proof of work block on the beacon chain. Um, this has like the problem is this approach has a problem uh, that the uh, proposer, the malicious proposer, or uh, just buggy proposer can like include, you know, some uh, block that is a hundred blo blocks behind the head of the chain. Uh, so it would require to some additional conditions, right? Like total difficulty to not allow to do easily. So these two may be combined. Like we can say that we are expecting the merge at this uh, total difficulty. Um, uh, level, uh, but not later than this epoch. So that's that how it could work uh, together. So like balance. Uh, next is balance attack. What should go? What could go wrong uh, here? So the balance attack is like pretty simple. Uh, so instead of making this transition block happen, miners start to um, to build a lot of forks around it and never, and this transition block never happens. Um, so that could 
the, yeah, that could be addressed by uh, like at least one honest miner that will eventually build this block. It will, if like the major of hash power doing something like that, uh, and the only uh, minor my uh, minority of hash power tries to build this block, it will take some time, but it will eventually happen. Or uh, use the epoch number to as like the um, countermeasure to this kind of attack. So the balance attack is like the uh, liveness attack. It's pretty easy to understand and yeah, relatively easy to mitigate. Uh, so let's speak about the safety attack. Um, so that's probably, that's really difficult topic. Um, I will try to cover it as much of, with as much clearance as I could. Uh, so what, uh, what could go really bad if we see 51% uh, attack or, yeah, uh, we, we, with uh, whatever reasons uh, it, it, it could have and whatever um, mm, results it could carry. So uh, why this may happen? The reason behind why this may happen lays like in the, um, in the future value of ETH for miners, uh, which means that miners invested in the hardware and uh, invested like in the future of uh, mining on Ethereum. Um, and uh, the merge just vanished this future value. So meaning that the hardware after the point of merge becomes, you know, useless. So, and since a lot of, since like the biggest, the big chunk of uh, hash power is set, set now to Ethereum mainnet, that's become a real problem. So there is no alternative. <clears throat> and uh, they, uh, they don't need to, miners don't need to collude to organize this 51% attack. It's not the like highly likely scenario. But they might just uh, rent their hardware, their hash, uh, their hash power to via nice hash to some party that could organize this attack. Why would they do this? Because like, just imagine you're uh, you're a miner and there is like only a hundred of blocks left to to the merge, um, and uh, you can calculate the rewards you get. You can like predict the rewards you get from keep mining honestly up to the point of merge and uh, you may uh, uh, decide to try to sell your hash power uh, for like that for 10x of this price or 100x doesn't matter um, so some x um, and that's that's it that's the reason so it means that will um, anyone who is uh, who is uh, who want to like make something bad? Do double spend will be able to do this, uh, renting this hardware for an hour, uh, renting this hash power. Um, so that's like the main problem. Um, and yeah, we can, of course, it can be mitigated by some social countermeasures, just to you know. Uh, ask exchanges and marketplaces to block, to, to stop or limit deposits and withdrawals. Um, also, someone can uh, track the nice hash and if you see a lot of hash power there, it can be rent and sent back to Ethereum. Uh, but yeah, can we do something in protocol that will protect us from this um, that will uh, help us to mitigate this uh, game theoretically unstable situation. Mm, so yeah, we can try at least. So let's just see three, uh, let's just look, go through these three uh, possible scenarios. So first one is keep, uh, let, let miner keep the proof of work chain. They will be able to do this uh, regardless uh, and uh, uh, pay rewards uh, for these blocks uh, on the beacon chain, on the on the not on the beacon chain, but on the 
uh, main net that is secured by the beacon chain, by the, by the proof of stake. Uh, it could be done like by just, if some authorized party promised to pay these rewards out of its own pocket, um, like for example, Ethereum Foundation. The other way is to implement a kind of uh, payment uh, schema uh, that will do this in a trustless fashion. So uh, like uh, miner submits a block, uh, the proof of work, uh, it, it hash part is verified and the block is like the part of the canonical chain and the rewards are just issued to the coin base of this block. Um, the, uh, this, um, this approach has like the problem for miners uh, that they will have to either trust to this authorized party uh, or they have to trust the Ethereum developers um, and because Ethereum developers may just rip off uh, this uh, payment, cha payment uh, channel uh, after the merge happens. So there is a trust here. Uh, so miners will have to trust. Um, can we do it trustless for miners? Yes, we can. We can pay extra. For example, we can pay extra rewards uh, like before the merge. So we can pay for their future value for, for their investments and re make this return of investments to them. Um, yeah, that's that's great. I mean, that's, that would be appropriate approach for miners to pay extra rewards prior to the merge. Um, it should be like big chunk of rewards, um, I think. Um, by the way, the question is how much? Um, and uh, yeah, what's what's the problem here? Um, this, uh, uh, once the miners start approaching the merge and the same hundred blocks before the merge uh, with all the extra rewards paid before, they can do the same. Uh, it does not diminish this um, attacking vector. So they just, they still can, or a portion of miners still can go and rent their uh, hash rate, uh, computing the revenue uh, from selling the hash rate and getting these extra rewards. So it does not eliminate this vector. Um, because there is no, like, you know, they uh, can, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, so that's, that's what they can do uh, in this case anyway. Also, it will uh, attract more hash and hash power from different other blockchains and like um, uh, may the payment of extra rewards per miner less lower, but yeah, that's the question of how much rewards to pay. So uh, can we improve this use case? Uh, yes, we can improve it. Uh, instead of like paying the rewards uh, on the Ethereum mainnet, these extra rewards, so regular rewards keeps uh, being paid. Uh, we can issue these extra rewards on the beacon chain before the merge uh, in a form of a validator balance. Um, so uh, miners uh, will have locked value uh, since withdrawals will be available after the merge only. So it will be locked on the beacon chain and uh, uh, they will be discouraged to make any attack uh, because there is some value locked on the chain that they will uh, be able to get only after this, this kind of attack, which can damage uh, the reputation of Ethereum and just uh, lower the price of the um, token. So. But uh, yeah, it's, but miners can, you know, so sell this uh, validators balance uh, by either set the withdrawal address to some parties uh, address uh, they are selling their uh, rewards to, or just by uh, using the staked ETH derivatives. Uh, I I've heard that there are already uh, some of them in place. So they can sell it here before the merge and uh, do the same thing. So, uh, which means that there is no ideal solution. Um, yeah, it's very difficult uh, to find the solution that is that works for both uh, for the merge and for miners. And uh, uh, the, the other really big question is how much to pay. Um, so really, um, 
we don't have this the, the whole picture we don't have this information and we highly likely not have the uh, the information to compute how much to pay to miners uh, with these extra rewards so the best strategy seemed to be like just to communicate to to work with miners community to to get to some uh, points uh, around this problem that are that is that will satisfy like all parties okay so yeah let's stop for questions here um, and we have like a few minutes more probably to cover some something else does anyone have any questions i have a question i posted on the chat this is Jordan. Uh, what motivates the the miners to stick around to the very last block? Uh, namely, it's it probably takes them some time to change over to another blockchain. So, no matter how big this reward is, they may probably want to start somewhat earlier. Can this um, basically? turn into a situation where we run out of miners little by little and it's getting very thin? Um, yeah, uh, fair question. Um, they may turn to other chains, but I don't think there is a, uh, a place for all of the hash power that is on Ethereum uh, as of today. Um, so we don't, we will likely not see like this uh, huge migration of hash power um, and uh, anyway, some of them will stay stay on the network because it, yeah, because it will be more profitable to turn to the other one. That's that's it. So somebody will stay anyway. And do what? Start a fork afterwards, or? Um. Yeah, that's that, that's the problem. That's the problem of this kind of attacks. So they may uh, rent their hardware. Um, yeah, hash power. They may uh, they may keep building the fork, yeah, afterwards. But uh, the, it it will not be Ethereum. It will not have the value value of Ethereum. All the value will be on this proof of stake chain. Thank you. So probably there will be some value. I don't know. Actually, this is like you know. Hi. So I just have one question. So basically as an investor, um, if you have ether, ether with you, so do we need to do anything to change it to ETH 2.2, 2 .2? 2.0? Um, to, to, to make this merge? Yes. So what happens uh, yeah, to yeah. our... No? What yeah, happens yeah, to have... the... Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll have to change uh, the beacon chain. Beacon chain will include the actually the mainnet block, so the application block. And uh, yeah, that's like the uh, like the core change. And uh, yeah, there are some other changes. They are like changing the one data voting, you know. So, but it's not like the significant change uh, changes related to the to put the application um, block to the beacon block and make the beacon block invalid if the execution is invalid. So that's the main change. Yeah, yeah. there is also a pull request to the Ethereum uh, to all specs repository that uh, has the like the spec for the merge, uh, the beacon chain spec. So I can drop it here in the chat if you're interested. If so, if there are no questions, uh, we can speak about the quick merge, uh, which is the recent proposal by Vitalik. Uh, what is the difference to the executable beacon chain to what we had discussed recently? Or we, we can speak about when merge, uh, it's up to you. I think the quick merge sounds interesting. And, you know, I think 
just keep on going through your slides. Um, I'm okay, sure people okay. will be able to stand around. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks, Peter. Uh, okay, quick merge. Why a fork choice change? This is the proposal that Vitalik uh, published like a few days ago. Uh, so what is proposed is actually what what's what's it about? Yeah, that's about the merge and the quickest path to the merge. Uh, so what it is? Um, Test one two three. Yep, I hear you. Oh, it is working finally. <laughs> cool. I'll go back to mute now. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, the quick merge, um, the proof of stake part. Yeah. We have like this, uh, consensus node and the application node, um, uh, in place. So let's just imagine this. So the consensus node, the beacon chain node starts to, starts to build blocks with a placeholder for the proof of work block it's for the application block. Um, and once the total difficulty reaches the transition point, the point of transition um, on the proof of work side, uh, the proposer of the beacon block just takes the entire block with the consensus part as well and embeds it into the beacon block. A tester starts, if, if a tester see that that happened, they verify uh, the total difficulty, they verify that block is available and valid from proof of work standpoint and from the execution standpoint and starts building like proof of stake application blocks on top of it. Uh, like start building the beacon blocks that include the application uh, blocks in them. So pretty much what we have been talked about, but uh, simplified and has, and the this proposal has the um, docking procedure described as well. Uh, so how, uh, what is like, just let's just compare it. So the executable beacon chain and the quick merge. So executable beacon chain doesn't use the block structure. It's rather used the application payload, which is stripped down block. Uh, with Alex's proposal, um, is about to include the RLP encoded beacon application block. Uh, the reason behind this is to make the less changes on the application node side because it used to uh, work with RLP. So if one data voting stays unchanged here for the quick merge, so we have this like seven hours delay um, between deposits, uh, between made deposits and deposits uh, in, in used on uh, uh, on the chain. Uh, so yeah, while we can execute a working chain that proposes to reduce this to follow distance to one block. So the deposits from the previous block will be included in the next one. Um, it ha it also, the executable working chain introduced like the new EVM of code, which is the beacon block root. There is no EVM changed in the quick merge, but the block hash and the difficulty problem still exist. Um, it requests, it asks, it needs the key check to 56 on the beacon chain, which should not be a big deal, right? So, uh, but uh, we try to avoid this uh, probably, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, the proposal requires, has this requirement. Uh, also, yeah, it is total difficulty as transition ball condition. And uh, uh, the fork choice, uh, near transition block to include this transition block, uh, the fork choice of the beacon chain is modified to wait for the proof of work block to verify the proof of work block. This is happening not inside of the state transition function and not becomes a part of a block, beacon block validity, but rather the fork choice um, uh, rule that the block, the beacon block will not be accepted by the fork choice uh, unless the proof of work block in, er, included in, in it is valid and available. Yeah, that's, and if if uh, it's not valid or not available, it, uh, the entire block will be invalidated. And uh, yeah, the next proposer will build on top, not of this one block, but its parent and try to include its own uh, proof of work block and so forth. And eventually we'll, we will get this uh, done. So that's like the, the, comparison between these two approaches. So that's it. That's about a quick merge.
to simplify some things. But yeah, in general, a lot of works stay unchanged. Okay, so we're running out of time, I guess. Um, um, do we want to keep? Yep. Um, actually, um, Michal, I, I'd be interested if you could just uh, cover the way to merge as well. I think that would be interesting for everyone. So please do uh, go through the rest of those slides. Okay, okay, yeah, it's actually quick. So I used the Ben Edgington slide. Yeah, it's just nice to, it's nice a reference point to discuss when merge. So this, like uh, the idea to put the execution to the beacon chain instead of shard makes it independent on the data shards and simplifies actually sharding design a bit. So there is no need to build shard chains. There will be just shard blobs. Uh, and now the question, since these two parts of these two major upgrades of uh, Ethereum are independent from each other, what ships first? So it may happen. It may uh, like happen that the merge ships before sharding or sharding before merge. So that's the question here. Um, it has its uh, both scenarios has its own pros and cons, uh, like governance, um, because. Yeah, once the merge happens, if we start to introduce data shards, it probably will be more difficult in terms of governance uh, to pass it through the all core dev calls. But yeah, uh, anyway, uh, this is like the um, the overview uh, on what uh, what could be the order there are, uh, of the shard and yeah merge. But yeah, the scope of work. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to give any uh, like uh, prediction here. Um, so the rough consensus uh, about uh, what goes first is like what's ready first goes first. So that's it. Uh, that's pretty simple and fair. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, merge where we are now, uh, we had this proof of concept that covers and addresses some major research uh, points and we have like this spec, the beacon chain, we started to work on the beacon chain spec, we actually have it and yeah, we need to do some more work, but the spec is already in place. Uh, there are some still research open questions there and uh, there is no yet the specification for the application layer. So we are somewhere here, what we are here. So next to, finish the specs, get the implementations done, run the various kind of test nets, get the infrastructure prepared and test it as well. So uh, if we want individual stakers to keep using uh, services like Infuro, it will have to implement this like block production feature. Uh, we should reach the community agreement and the miners agreement and especially the miners part of community um agreement on the on what we do uh, near to the merge we also also have some evaluation criteria so what would be the transaction throughput of a block after the merge um, so it's important because uh, the beacon chain is like a time restricted um system so uh, and uh, if block takes too much time to uh, execute it could damage the consensus part uh, so yeah, we should build like a threat model. There is some kind of, uh, uh, um, there are two on the table, for, there are two uh, vectors on the table of threat model. One of them is verifies dilemma and the other one is the resource exhaustion attack uh, on the consensus through the, the execution. So it should be addressed. Uh, so I see a lot of work to do. And uh, we will do the hard work and once it's ready, we'll just ship it. So it's like um, my intuition that all, mo most of this work can be done this year, but not sure that the merge will happen this year. And so it's likely not as for me, this is my own opinion. So that's that's like the, yeah, the when merge part. That's all.
Yeah, we have some other slides, but no, we, we have no time. Thank you so much for it. And uh, yeah, please ask your questions if you have them. Thank you, Michal. A any questions, um, everyone? My microphone wasn't working before, but I think there was a question before about um, will there be any effect on people who are holding ether? Um, not sure who asked it, but uh, I don't think that necessarily got answered. Like if I'm holding ether, is it going to is it going to make any change to what I do? Say as an investor, like I'm not really investing, but as a, as a speculator, if I'm buying and selling ether. You mean the price or wallets or which part? The process. Oh, Oh yeah, that's so is that's it all going to disappear? Do I have to go and upgrade my wallet or, or whatever? Uh, you you will have to. It depends on your wallet, but uh, if you have if you're running like an Ethereum native client, you will have to upgrade it. That's that's it. Um, yeah, but it will it should go smooth for um, most of the infrastructure part for wallets and. So you, you keep using the main net and you, you will keep using it. Uh, there will be like, uh, as I mentioned, they will be highly likely like the um, withdrawals limitations and deposit limitations around the merge or they will just stop on exchange. So, but that's temporal solution uh, to prevent some malicious behavior, uh, to protect from this behavior around the point of merge. So yeah, and to, about regarding prices, I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's the price is so. As for me, the price is so independent of the technology uh, layer. So it's really difficult to say what happens with prices. What will happen? I had a question. Then, if no one has. Um... I think in uh, yeah, thanks for also explaining the quick merge, uh, Mikhail. In one of your er earlier slides, um, I think early on, um, this is re like re really near the beginning. I wanted to check if I understood it right. That um, yeah, this maybe th uh, this this one here. Yeah, I think we can do do this one here, right? Um, is there a time? Like in the quick merge, it was the, there was um you know a time when both systems were kind of running parallel, right? Because there's a the placeholder, and I kind of thought that um in in the you know the normal merge proposal it, it might be something like that. Is there a time when um it's like the you know the two clients are like acting to, together as one, but you know the proof the proof of work um mainnet is still um you know just operating as normal right it's like everything is in place and you know the, the beacon chain has the app payload which is the eth1 block but you know the, the beacon chain is not in control yet is my question yeah yeah. yeah yeah right i get your question so let's go to this slide so the this you're actually asking whether what what would be the placeholder for not the quick merge but for the regular one, right? So, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. That's one question. The, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, uh, it's been not covered by the executable beacon chain proposal. So this this like the separate docking procedure, it's, it hasn't been covered there. But uh, one of the other way to include not the entire block but uh, just a, a block hash of you know of the proof of work block. Uh, so uh, if we have this application payload here, yeah, it contains the block hash of the application chain block for the reason that we need it to be explicit to reason about the uh, application chain finality, uh, probably for some other reasons. So there will be a block hash. So this application payload may just take this block hash and leave all other fields uh, zeroed uh, which will signal to the testers of, of the next uh, attesters that uh, start to adhere between the blocks that this is the the last uh, this is the uh, the candidate for the last proof of work block. So the same placeholder mechanism as it is here, but probably like different information placed. Uh, okay. in, so there will be a placeholder, and yeah, that's it. And, and I think part of 
yeah, the first question that that was asked was, um, you know, if things go wrong, because it's like when we have these placeholders, right? There's going to be that, that system is going to be running for for some amount of time, so that we can really see if there's any any problems before it actually before the beacon chain takes over. Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Um, any problems on the proof of work side, or or I guess or you mean like, in the um, setup? Yeah, yeah, because there's a bunch of um like different so software r r running, and I guess I, the way I think I'm trying to think about it is if it was like one piece of software. It's like there might be yeah. a lot of like du duplicated information, you know, but uh, or, or is that duplicated information going to be running, you know, for I don't know may maybe few weeks or a month and then you oh. know and then it looks like the transition might be s simpler yeah i see but we can we cannot know for sure because uh unless transition happens uh, until transition has not happened uh, you can't uh, you can't run both uh, like mm, how to say it uh you you can't run uh both uh the both fork choice together so you can't do this you can't it doesn't make sense to run execution on the beacon beacon chain uh, and produce blocks of um, application blocks in parallel to the proof of work chain so um, it, of course it will be tested there will be a production uh, like uh, environment uh, production like test net with huge amounts of data um, to test it through and to test the docking procedure. I, I anticipate it will be tested like a dozens of time, um, times, but uh, it, yeah. So there is no like, you know, uh, solution that will, um, you know, do this kind of backup um, for if something goes wrong. Right, so it it just at one moment it will switch to the proof of stake and goes from there. That's how it's going to happen, and there is no. It seems there is no other way. So okay, thanks. yeah. I'm um, um, sorry, I haven't I haven't monitored I haven't tracked the chat. So if anything else there, uh, just ask it directly. Okay. Yeah. So um, crypto chick. Do you want to just ask it out loud? Uh, Sly has addressed it, but um, I'll I'll pose the question and maybe um, you can have a direct conversation with um, CryptoCheck after. So basically just wanting to know how the merge is likely to affect all the dApps that have been built on ETH1. You know, so how should people prepare uh, for post ETH1? Apart from the, yeah. But including the randomness you mentioned yeah apart from randomness uh, or maybe even in discussing the randomness as well exactly to have a clear understanding of you know if you're using um <clears throat> difficulty as a source of randomness or block hash how people are best um to deal with that or get ready for the merge uh yeah uh so it mostly, as I said previously, it will mostly stay uh, remain uh, remain the same. Uh, I mean, DAP uh, tool chains uh, uh, and developers tool chains and so forth. Uh, yeah, the the randomness is like the biggest uh, change, the biggest shift here. So that's like uh, other than that, it will probably not changed at all so that depends on the depth so we will we will post uh, we will publish this uh, the kind of change and try to uh, cover depths uh, what, what will be changed in particular in the json rpc for example so um yeah to commit to to make the uh, sure that smart contract developers can participate in in the discussion and point out to some problems that we might not which that we might oversee
Yeah, we, uh, the question from Sly is, yeah, we can insert Rendao into the block uh, and make it a part of a block hash, but uh, the, the reason is that you can change the coin base or you can create like 10 blocks with different coin bases and pick whatever. Uh, it will all them all of them will contain the same Rendao mix, but they will be will result in different block hashes. You you may use diff, uh, different transaction sets included in a block to manipulate the block hash. So uh, yeah, the the proof of work uh, nonce uh, is computed after the block is assembled, and uh, yeah, it depend it uses the the hash of assembled block. To compute nonce, that's why it's uh, protected by the proof of work, the randomness and property of block hash. It's not; it will not be the case for. It. So you you still can manipulate the block hash after the merge. Um, could I ask a question? Yep. Um, sure. Yeah. So just, um, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but um, so if I've got a DAP and I say was submitting transactions directly to JSON RPC on an Ethereum client right at the moment, then even as the merge is happening, that transaction pool that's available is going to be still there, um, you know, because the transactions are still being processed by um, the application client, and it's really the it's only the blocks um, that are being dealt with by the um, the beacon chain client. So there's no change essentially to the transaction pool and such like, is there? Yeah, completely right. So yeah, the central transaction, for example, will stay, will remain the same, and uh, yeah, transaction pool stays unchanged. So it will be. Seamless in terms of that, the merge will be seamless in terms of. Okay, great. So maybe if we've, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you, you can go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say if there were no more questions, let's flip to the last slide, but um, it sounds like there's another question. Oh, just might be a quick one. Um, would the yeah, would the Dropston testnet be the one that we would um, try this merge and all, all the docking stuff? Or because we need to use a proof of work testnet. So I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's going to be, I think it will be uh, the one. It will probably turn to the proof of stake completely. I don't know, actually. We haven't decided yet. But yeah, some tests will be on the Dropston. And uh, it would be great to turn it into proof of stake and like a proof of uh, concept on much higher le level than we have of today. Thank you. Okay, so Mikhail, if you can, um, if you could flip to the last slide there, that'd be fantastic. Um, you mean the last, which one? The, the one that's um, got the the forthcoming talks. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Sorry. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you. All right. Well, so thank you, Mikhail, for doing a fantastic talk. I think um, we're all doing virtual claps uh, for you. So that was an awesome talk. Um, so thank you. Um, so in two weeks time, we're going to have a, a, a week off, as it were, or a fortnight off. And then in about a month's time, we're going to hear about Tracer, which is a peer-to-peer -peer finance platform. Um, two weeks after that, um, we've got uh, Raphael's going to be coming along and talking about the state of blockchain interoperability. Um, so the April the 14th one's going to be happening at, in the middle of the day, again, um, for those people who live in Brisbane, Australia, um, so 12.30. And the one on blockchain interoperability, Rafael lives in Portugal. So I think that's going to be 5 p.m. But just check meetup.com. So there are there is actually another talk after that on um, decentralized cross-chain automatic market makers. Um, but I haven't um, released it on meetup.com yet. And it's not in this um, little slide here. 
So look, um, thank you everyone for joining the call. It was fantastic that everyone could come along. Thank you, Mikhail, for doing a fantastic talk. Uh, I think we all know so much more about um, the merge than, um, well, I, I know more about the merge than I used to. So thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks Peter for inviting me and thanks for the, for, thanks to audience for your questions and yeah. And, Thank you so much, Michal. That was really interesting. Yeah. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thank yeah. you, Michal. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.